Proud to be sponsored by Diamond Bright, the car care products that have been keeping the furious fleet looking their best for a long time already. To find all you need to keep your car clean and protected, follow the link below to diamondbright.co.uk. You join me today at the wheel of a very significant car. The last true Skoda, but also the first Skoda in the Volkswagen Group dynasty of the new era of Skodas. This is a 2000 Skoda Felicia Classic. This is definitely not a performance car, but so much more fun for it. I shouldn't have worn this red t-shirt, I'm blending into the car today. This doesn't go well. So this is a Skoda Type 791, the Felicia or Felicia, or the, the Felice Nevedad. The Skoda Felice Nevedad is a really, really significant car for Skoda and the Volkswagen Group. But uh, one big reason, this is, well, that's two reasons in one. This is the last true Skoda built on a solely Skoda platform, but also the first Skoda that Volkswagen had a hand in improving and becoming Volkswagen quality. I mean, the good quality, not the, the Volkswagen quality we don't talk about. So under this vaguely squared off polo-ish skin, there is in fact an old Skoda favorite. In 1994, on the Charles Bridge in Prague, they unveiled this, the new Volkswagenized Felicia, to worldwide acclaim. It may have been ignored. I think it was generally well received though. So the range ran from 1995, when it was actually released, until 2000, apart from the estates and pickups, which continued until 2001, which had apparently 95% input from Czech engineers, although I'm pretty certain I can see more than 5% Volkswagen in this car when I look through the window. Volkswagen were determined to retain Skoda's position as the uh, value um, entry in their range, but at the same time, they wanted the, the quality to be as good as everything else in the Volkswagen range. So they had some significant input with engines, electrics, uh, fixtures and fittings, uh, interior components you'll see in a second. So, and yeah, noticeably that door thump is not tinny, plasticky, folly party. That's a proper door thump. You know, that's, that's good quality. Um, under the bonnet, there was mostly Volkswagen stuff, apart from this one, which is actually the biggest selling engine. We'll come to that in a second as well. Here at the front, it is very, very square and angular, unlike the Volkswagens and Audis and, well, Seats as well, in the VW range, um, which are very much more swoopy and curvy. This stuck with a square angular look, keeping it looking more, well, less, I'm gonna say less premium, but I don't mean it in a derogatory way. I just mean in a way to, to set its place in the Volkswagen range. Although one thing I do still notice, even after all this time, whenever I see a Skoda from this era coming towards me in the road, I go, oh, it's a Rover R8. Um, it never is, it's always one of these. Right, let's look under the bonnet. Now, I will say this bonnet is obviously noticeably faded. However, these were noted for the quality of their paint back at the time. So I think with a little bit of polish, this will come up really nicely. Under the bonnet, Volkswagen were also trying to Volkswagenize the engine range. So there were three engine choices, and two of them were new Volkswagen units headed for Golfs and Polos as well as this. Then there was the 1.9 diesel making 63 horsepower. And finally, there was this, Skoda's own 1.3 litre alloy blocked pushrod OHV engine, which for most European markets got the uh, Bosch monopoint fuel injection, but was incredibly available with Carbretta in some markets still. And that made 67 or 54 brake horsepower respectively. Skoda had developed a 1.6 litre petrol of their own, but that was dropped in favour of the new VW Group motors. Something we've just noticed, which is quite interesting, that this strut brace is standard on all the 1.3s. I mean, I don't know why it wasn't available on the 1.6s. The only thing I can imagine is the larger VW engines gave some form of additional bracing to the front structure of the car, and with the smaller 1.3, you needed this extra uh, bracing now. Don't know, if you do know, answer in the comments below. I'll be fascinated to learn. Ah, now into the very, very, very Volkswagenized interior. Lots of stuff on here, it looks so massively polo-ish because it is. Look at this Volkswagen polo steering wheel with a Skoda badge stock on it. You peel this off, there's probably a VW logo molded into the bottom of this, uh, this rubber. All these buttons, these kind of curvy buttons, which are slightly at odds with the very, very square exterior of the car, um, are curvy because they're from a polo. Now, like the door slam, the interior quality is very good. The plastics are really high quality, but weirdly they've been kind of molded and graded in a way so that they don't look as premium as they actually are, so that you don't get out of this and into a polo and not see the difference. They're designed specifically to be good quality but not look as good as they actually are. 
Right, let's look through the interior and see what we've got. Well, lots of curves again. This is uh, late 90s, early 90s curveness, which seems to be a recurring theme on a lot of videos lately. Well, these aren't so ovoid as previously. This is just swoopy and geometric and stuff. Uh, the driver's door, in fact, all the doors, are heavily carpeted in this kind of hard-wearing, uh, not corduroy exactly, but grooved fabric. So solid elephant hide grey with elephant hide grey door pockets which are nice and solid. Uh, big, big door bucket rather than the door bin uh, with a loud speaker hidden in it which is good. Manual windows of course because we don't want you to have all electric windows unless you're going to go and buy a polo and spend a bit more money. Elephant hide door handles which are plastic but feel so solid uh, which is a great thing. A little manual door mirror moving debris just there. All good stuff. They're moving into the dashboard where we've got a sudden step up as we've now got a rev counter, a speedo going to 120, your temperature gauge, fuel gauge, all the warning lights. This is all straight from the VW parts bin and just looks really fresh, really ergonomically good, really pleasing to the eye. So it's all, all good stuff in here. And then this is all mounted in a big curvy dashboard with a big curvy binnacle with big curvy air vents. So yeah, lots of curves and Volkswagen stuff. And then there's this blanking plate, which uh, on no model in the range has anything at all. If you leave this out, there's just a screw which holds the dashboard in. Uh, maybe on some of the Polo models, there is something here, but not on this one. The switch gear is all very, very neat and tidy. A lovely long row of buttons here and a matching shorter row just here. Starting on the left-hand side in the middle, got a couple of blanking plates because they want you to spend more money on options. Then we've got hazard lights, obviously, heated rear window, obviously, and then two rather confusing ones because down here, you've got what would normally be a headlight on-off switch, a nice round turny dial like on a Mercedes or a Ford. But no, that's a headlight leveling. Your on-off switch for the lights are these buttons up here. So hit the side light button to get side lights and then the dip headlight button to get dip headlights. Although what the owner tells me you can do is just hit the dip headlight button and leave it on and then just have the side light button to control everything all on at once. And of course your normal main beam function is on the stalk as usual. Over to the right, your front and rear fog lights or only rear on this particular carpet. If there were front, that's where it will be. <laughs> um, just having a quick chat with the owner, I'm going to pass on second hand information so don't shoot me. <laughs> Apparently, he has seen not heated seats, but heated mirrors on these two blank switches. So, weird. I don't know. Right, okay. Then we have the Volkswagen steering wheel, which I mentioned earlier, which does have the horn for the horn test. Yeah, I'm going to call that suitable. This is a suitable horn for the horn test. This kind of suits the car. Good road clearing ability, but not too deep and uh, uh, authoritarian. Moving back to the dashboard, we have a weirdly oversized cigarette lighter. This car is missing its cigarette lighter adapter. The owner has hunted for one just to sort of complete the dashboard look, but regular ones of other cars just kind of fall out, and so do USB and um, the 12 volt plug thingies fall out of here as well. So it's a slightly oversized 12 volt socket. Thanks, Skoda. <laughs> Next to a vast sweet wrapper tray, uh, you could probably put Actually, I'm going to say you could get a pack of four Mars bars in there, so that's um, handy for picnics. Non-standard radio in this car, which is an upgrade, I'm absolutely certain, on what was here originally. And then loads and loads of, of storage, binnacle type things. We've got oh, a tangle. We've got lots of space for phones, wallets, glasses, that kind of stuff. We've got another one here, so if you're using your phone as a sat-nav, you can, or maybe you can't because the gear stick's been knocked over. We've got an unusable phone slot and We've got two cup holders. Let's go a tea shelf test. Let's try the cup holders. Wow, it fits. I thought there was gonna be a fail. That fits, and unlike Sayat, who do the uh, weird one size larger than the other cup holders, these are both the same size and both fit. And I thought also that it was gonna be too shallow, and so this would topple over, but this actually is fairly uh, well, well held. And I can get all the gears. Oh, well done. 10 out of 10 for cup holders. However, tea shelf, oh dear. This is not a T-shelf success. And you might be saying, but what about the glove box? Are there places for a picnic in the glove box? Can we grow cress in here? No, it's a top opening glove box. So unless you've got a very, very light cup, I'll just balance on there. No, this is, no, T-shelf fail. So, sorry Skoda, it's a 10 out of 10 for cup holders, but a zero out of 10 for T-shelf. Very often, very, very rare we do a zero out of 10 on the T-shelf. <sighs> this is all swoopy, too curvy to even put anything on there. No Swiss roll, no sushi, no, no jam sandwiches. Sorry, Skoda. But anyway, glove box, quite a good size. Big, deep thing. Room for your 
Oh, well, tons of stuff actually goes down a really long way. You could fill that with a lot of soup actually. That would be a good soup hole. Well, that's the front of the car. Let's look in the back. Now the back of the car, whoa, it's a little tight getting in. Be careful to get your nose on the door top because if you notice this door, this, sorry, if you notice this roof line, it goes kind of come quite a long way down from the roof itself to the door aperture. So you can quite easily clip your nose or your ears getting in. Which is something to be aware of. The seats are quite well indented and there's a lot of space underneath them. So this is actually not bad space. It's a little bit claustrophobic because you are kind of penned in a tiny bit, but physically it's not a bad bit of room. You've got grab handles, coat hooks, little folder ashtray thing in the doors, a communal cup holder in the center, and seat belts for three people. Uh, there is no armrest in the middle. So with the headrests out, there's a little lever on either side at the top. Just roll that forward, that rolls flat. And then with the seat belts pulled out, which I won't do because it's a lot of aggro right now, this whole thing will roll forward again, giving you masses of space. With those seats rolled forward, it goes from 272 to 976 liters of space, which is, which is bigger than a Lexus IS Estate. So this is the boot itself. It's a nice big usable space, even bigger of course with that seat folded down. In fact, the owner tells me that when he uh, bought a spare tailgate for this car, it fitted in the boot. The boot fitted in the boot, which is quite impressive. You've got little alcoves to the side, which are not particularly usable because there's no netting across them. But you have got four little nice lash down hoops, which hold the carpet down in place when they're pushed flat. Uh, underneath here, we have got a full size spare wheel and we've got a little light up here. So all good. A couple of little housekeeping notes. I forgot to mention to access the boot, as well as the button on the tailgate, there's also, in the style of the Rover and Hondas I so adore, a little tag quite well hidden. And secondly, the key. It's just a key, isn't it? Well, no, it's a double-sided key, a la Volkswagens of the late 90s, early noughties. Uh, before 1998, this was a single-sided, uh, boring, old-fashioned, much more simple type key. In 1993, when Skoda was bought by the Volkswagen Group, uh, they were still seen as the butt of a lot of rather unfair jokes, because by that point, they had improved their quality quite dramatically, and the cars were actually rather good. But they still had the vestiges of decades of communist lack of investment and quality control, meaning that Skoda jokes were still a very much a thing. How do you double the value of a Skoda, fill it with petrol? How do you keep your hands warm in your Skoda? turn on the rear screen heater when you're pushing it, that kind of thing. But by the time the Favorite was on the market, these cars were actually pretty decent. So Volkswagen really wanted to shake off all the bad old images, bad old memories, and make it into a quality product that people will be proud to have. Horses. And so, they sunk 60 million Deutschmarks into the development of this car. And it really does show. So this was the last car built on a Skoda platform and the first car to have Volkswagen input. The car that replaced it, the Fabia, was all Volkswagen. So when this car ended, the whole Skoda lineage really truly went with it. So after that, everything was just a badge engineered uh, Volkswagen. And looking at the press reviews at the time, and then more importantly, the customer reviews, JD Power. By the mid 90s, this car, not this particular car, but you know, cars from its range, were third from top in JD Power owner satisfaction. And Skoda as a brand was making the top entry, the, the most satisfied owners in the UK were Skoda owners. You could argue that if you're buying a car with low expectations, it's easy to meet those expectations. But the fact was, they were getting a lot of engineering on a sturdy platform, which actually drives quite well. So what's it like on the road? Well, the ride is a little bit bouncy, if I'm perfectly honest, but it seems to grip quite well. So we're hitting into a relatively brisk corner here, which tightens as we go through. And steering input's nice. The car does lean a little bit as you go through heading into a 30 limit, so heavy on the brakes. The brakes aren't massively powerful, but you know, they're not leaving me feeling worried at all. And the gear change was really complimented at the time, being a nice 
crisp change. It's only done 64,000 miles over the last 20 odd years. So it's, uh, so it's not had a lot of wear in it. Now I did read that these were only available with the five speed manual gearbox. No automatic option at all. Which personally I have no problem with. Equipment wise, there isn't a lot. Most of them didn't really have anything much more than this. There was a top of the range one called the SLXI, which not all, but some got things like air conditioning and uh, ABS. Uh, this one's got an airbag in it because it's a 2000 car, so it's a very late car in the range. Um, but the SLXI top of one of the range car got that before other vehicles in the range did. And the absolute premium ones, of well, this and any other, uh, Skoda will be the L and K models. L and K being the initials of the company founders. And so when you get the ones with leather, dual zone climate, um, all the funny, all the good stuff, all the extra special sauce, not this version though, um, that was named after them. I'll flash the names up on the screen because I've literally forgotten what it is. Now there is no power steering on this car. Uh, 1.3s didn't get it as an option. It was available on the 1.6 and the 1.9 with a slightly heavier engine, of course. But the steering really isn't very heavy at all. So you kind of don't need it so much on this particular variant. Now, admittedly, it's no ball of fire, but it does get you away from the line rapidly enough, certainly as rapidly as you'd want to be in a car like this. Now on these bumpy little back roads, the suspension does kick and bounce a little bit, so it's not the most composed ride you've ever driven, but it does seem to grip fairly well. And visibility is amazing. This glass house is so tall. I mean, it's a, it's a bit like driving a small minibus or something. This windscreen is just acres of it and the door belt line is really low. So it's funny, as I climbed into the car, I felt like the roof was kind of rolling around on and encroaching into the glass, but really it's not. Because the glass is well above your eye line and well below your eye line. Now, according to type testy things, I've apparently got very good peripheral vision and I can barely see the B posts at the corner of my eye uh, for when I'm sitting forward. So it's like I'm sitting in a car with like no top on it almost. It's like a convertible or something, even though it's not. Now the thing I love about a car like this, which is not massively powerful, and okay, it's not dynamically the greatest car in the world, but it is quite competent, is that you can push on a little bit on the back roads and be having an absolute whale of a time and it feels like you're flying, you're pushing the car to its limits and we're currently doing 38 miles an hour. So you can really enjoy yourself and enjoy the car without putting yourself or others or your driving license at risk. were very popular. They sold like one and a half million of the things. All churned out of the factory in Czechoslovakia. None of your global factory malarkey going on with this one. So once you're out on a nice, smooth, fast road, there's still a little element of bounce in the suspension, but it does settle quite nicely. So doing, doing 50 or so on a, well, it's a 60 limit road, the car feels quite happy. It doesn't really feel like it wants to be pushing on much faster than this, but I'm sure it'll sit on a 70 mile an hour motorway quite happily, if a little noisily. Funtington, what a great name for a village. I want to live in Funtington. Never a dull day here. Ned Flanders would be your neighbor though. <laughs> Funny thing about this car, it always feels like you're going faster than you actually are. I just glanced down, I suddenly panicked for a second thinking I was on camera doing about 40 miles an hour or so. In fact, I was doing 25. I'm a big fan of the seat fabric in this car. It's very kind of late 90s Nickelodeon cartoon um, intro style pattern. 
I have to say, if I had a car called a Felicia, I'd have to nickname it something like Silverstone or Vikander or I don't know. I don't normally name cars, but if my car was just crying out for that kind of thing, I really would have to. Now, it's amazing how Skoda engender such a fierce loyalty in their customers. If someone buys one Skoda, they do almost inevitably buy another one and one after that as well. It can't just be the fact they represent good value for money. There must be something about this brand which really does endear them to their owners. I mean, apart from the massive satisfaction and reliability and great price in the first place. In fact, one of the selling points of this car at the time, in the early 90s anyway, before the Focus came out, was that you got a car the size and with the relative equipment of an Escort, but for the price of a Fiesta. It does lean into corners, it's quite hilarious. Forty miles an hour through the S's and I feel like I'm a rally driver. Whoa! <laughs> what a hoot. This road would need to be taken about 50, 60 or so to get the same kind of fun out of, I don't know, my Mercedes, for example, the grey one. I would have to be hooning it to get the same kind of reward from that as this car at uh, sub 40. The engine's a little bit thrashy. It's always very vocal and always very, very there. But the gearbox is good and it doesn't mind being worked, so it's quite a rewarding drive. Push it hard and you know about it. This is definitely not a performance car, but so much more fun for it. Well, thank you for joining me today in this little Skoda, perhaps unremarkable to the untrained eye, but really one of the most significant cars of European motoring in the last, what, 25 years. Quite an interesting and fun little thing. If you've enjoyed this, please hit like, please hit subscribe. Please join me again for another one very soon and share them all on Facebook and do stuff. I've no idea what's coming next. I never do. So join me again soon in something completely different.